All right, everybody, this is Ross the Fig Boss. So in today's video, we are gonna talk about what we've learned this fig season, the 2021 season. I wanna recap every single thing that we have covered. As you guys know, we just, you guys have been following me on this journey now of growing figs. You know, I didn't start out knowing everything, you know. Um, I've taken you guys along the way throughout this journey, trying different varieties, thinking of different techniques, learning about these amazing fig trees and how uh, mysterious they can be, and taking you guys along the way to now get you to this point of where we are, to share the knowledge that I have um, all along the way. You know, just really the best of my abilities, the best of my knowledge. These are my thoughts. These are my, even a lot of this is really my own original thoughts. So you guys are in good hands. But um, before we get into all of that, we really recap all that stuff. I do want to mention that just we have some fig cuttings for sale on FigBid. This has been a, a very, very quick sale this year. There's very few sets of cuttings left. And whatever is left, I think I may just... Um, probably do some sort of giveaway or just root them myself, whatever. Um, you know, I've already given away a, quite a few cuttings this year as I do every year. But uh, if you guys are interested, you know, this is kind of the time. I'm probably not going to be doing this past January. So I really would like to wrap this up in the next five to seven days. Um, and what I'm offering you guys is a 15% discount. If anybody wants the discount, all you have to do is message me on FigBid and say the promo code Ross in the message. Um, this is exactly where everything's being sold, by the way. There's no need to message me through some other, you know, method of messaging, whether that's email or Facebook or Instagram, whatever. Go to this website. It's in the description of all of my videos. You'll see the store. You'll see all the varieties here that I'm listing and you guys can buy them. For what I would consider actually pretty affordable prices, a lot of the varieties that are left are more affordable, more common. Um, there are some really interesting varieties left and I can't understand, really just don't wrap my head around some of the choices some of you guys make or other people make, you know, in regards to what variety they would like to grow. You know, sometimes I see where you guys live, of course, where I'm shipping the variety to, and then I see the variety that you guys ordered and it's just not, it doesn't always line up. And um, it's kind of a shame. So if, if you guys are new to this or you, you have questions like that, uh, feel free to ask. You know, I've been giving my opinions for years on this kind of thing. You know, um, I want you guys to make better decisions. And, um, you know, some of these are really tailored for people who are obsessed with figs and collectors others are for people who are newer others are for people who you know uh, live in very specific places so um you know i would just consider uh, at least reading all the descriptions on these varieties coming to some sort of good conclusion or even messaging me and then uh if you're interested of course buying them uh one of the couple of the varieties i just want to point out you know I guess we could go through the list really quickly. LDA is just a giant fig. Um, definitely has a lot of commercial potential for just selling something quite large. You know, if you need a larger fruit, you want that commercial potential. If you also have a drier climate, it does so well in your location that it will produce a really tasty fig. Here they tend to split a little bit more often than I'd like because of the size. Um, the Although it is a more elongated shape, it's not very slender. So for me, I don't, I, I'd be hard pressed and I'm actually trying to find a slightly smaller version of LDA that is a bit more slender in hopes that um, it'll perform better here. Um, but it is a standard early hardy it's got all the boxes checked except for some splitting here and there um colonel Littman's also i don't understand why this isn't just gone like uh this is seriously one of the best figs you could grow uh extremely tasty more tailored for people like myself in humid places it also ripens earlier than black madeira 
by many accounts, it is just a straight, a straight up better Black Madeira. Um, and you know, Black Madeira has that big name. Don't ask me why Colonel Lippmann's hasn't uh, gotten there yet. I guess uh, you know it does require a lot more light than your average variety. So if you're you're growing in only eight hours of light or lower, maybe not the best variety for you. JH Adriatic, another standard. People went crazy for this fig when I first started. It was uh, definitely a favorite. It is an Adriatic styled fruit, which is quite common among many of the varieties, but it's very, very good, you know? Um, so if you're not growing one of these, this is definitely a better option, in my opinion. Um, my tree's in the ground. Uh, and I think next year I'll, I'll see some good fruit set on that particular variety. We can talk more about it then. Uh, Negretta, same thing. This one just seems to me very underrated in people's minds. I don't know why. I think it's uh, right along there with like an RDB. You know, if you like Rondé Bordeaux, you're going to like this fig. It's super early, super hardy, uh, does well in, in moisture. You know, it's like, uh, again, checks all the boxes. Same thing with Bar Malone, another great choice for people in shorter season climates. I think it has some commercial potential. Um, you know, it's like a, a darker skinned, a black skinned white Marseille, it's some sort of mutation off of white Marseille. Very, very interesting. Um, I believe it also produces Breva. Uh, it's a hardy variety. I mean, it's got, again, for people like myself, it's in the ground. You know, it's a good option. Sultane, again, stupidly underrated. You know, I don't understand personally why some people choose, like I said, some people choose the weirdest figs. A lot of these varieties, excuse me, are just so standard. Like LSU Tiger checks all the boxes, you know. Uh, White Triana, again, super underrated fig. Um, easily, I think it is in my top 20 if it's not. It pretty much is. We are trying to see if uh, there are other varieties that will compete against it, but it's like a mid-season cold and hot. You know, that fig is amazing. Sultane, again, I, I just think LSU Tiger and Sultane are such great figs that for whatever reason, the name, how common they are, whatever it is, I mean, they're, you know, maybe not figs that you could say are in my top 20, but you'd be happy to have them. I mean, there's so many people who grow like varieties that just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. You know what I mean? Like you're banging your head against the wall. Um, these are just like as standard, reliable varieties as it gets. Brianzolo Rosso, um, yeah, this one's rather new to me, but what I know about it is that it tastes amazing. It's actually a very complex honey fig and I'm gonna get to that hopefully next season. Um, this one, this tree in particular was a bit shaded this year and we didn't get the fruit set that I really wanted. Um, but it's extremely early as well. So this is like one of the earliest to ripen figs right there with Ron de Bordeaux and a very interesting honey fig. The one downside I can see is that it does have a, a shape that maybe isn't ideal for people in humid places. So maybe, you know, like the Pacific Northwest, this would be a great option, um, easily. Nero 600M, you can't go wrong with Violet de Bordeaux. Noir de Barbentain, uh, we're still trialing this one. It does seem to ripen a little bit later than I'd like it to, but I did get some fruits this year off my in-ground tree. Um, it is extremely tasty, right up there with the cold, um, with the Black Madeiras in terms of that flavor profile. Very similar to Bordeaux Sot Noir, uh, a commercial variety. You know, it's, uh, it's fantastic. The Daloso has become one of my favorites. Um, I always loved it, but it really has shown itself to pr it proved in itself this year to be a much better option. Uh, now that I planted it in the ground, the shape has changed, the stem has changed, the le the length of the fig has changed. Blanche de Saison, you know, um, this fig is so tasty. I don't understand what it is exactly that. People haven't caught on. I think it's it's still just rather new to some people. When I had acquired this from Michael Grace in Virginia, um, this was his best fig apart from the Colden Ops. And 
when you taste it, you experience it, you'll know why. You know, um, it just is so good. Same thing with Col Noir. This is a synonym, in, you know, in my opinion, for Sucret, which is a variety that Bode in France introduced in the United States. And Sucret's really, it is in my top 20. Um, I had some fruits this year from Sucret that got through the hurricane. Ida, I think it was, that came through. And it just performed like a champ. I mean, it's just, yeah, I, I don't know. It To me, it tastes great. Uh, it produces super well. The fruits um, also dry extremely well. And for me, that's just a, a super great quality to have in a, in a variety. Violet Sapor, I know that uh, this is similar, if not the same, to Borges Soak Grease and Socorro Black and... Um, maybe like one or two other figs that I have, but, and people I think have, you know, have grown this fig and have it, and it's quite common now at this point, but Violet Sapor actually outperformed Bordeaux Grease um, by a pretty considerable margin. It did ripen about one to two weeks earlier. Um, and what I really like about this fruit is that it sets super well in this high dense system that I have, you know, planting my fig trees two to three feet apart. The same thing with LSU Holier or Huye. Uh, this actually, this fig here produces more fruit than any other variety I have in a very high dense, low light environment. That fig is insane in terms of like actual production. Same thing with LSU Champagne which I believe I'm out of at this point. Um, Panache, that's a great commercial variety. Of course, it's very common. You find them very easily at Whole Foods. Um, in the summer when uh, you know it's fig season, you can buy them actually from uh, commercial sellers at the grocery store. Safrari, this is a new one to me. I think it's gonna compete with White Triana um, and a couple other varieties for that spot in my collection, but this one I know Bass really likes and that he has said in multiple times actually that it, it comes back from the base from winter kill will fruit and ripen in that season, which is a really special characteristic, you know? Um, so it shouldn't be, it shouldn't ripen very late at all. Um, I know the fruits obviously look very good. I've seen the fruits myself, my own tree, um, on Bass's tree, on other people's tree. I think it's an underrated variety personally, very hardy as well. Um, but you know, even if it's not hardy where you live, it, it should do well for you regardless in a, in a short season place. Uh, you do have to worry, I think a little bit about splitting as well with uh, panache as well. You know, some of these varieties based on the shape, you gotta be careful if you live in a, a humid place. Rock and Nira, this is, um, one that my friend Joe in Toronto, had uh, introduced, this is a family fig of his from Italy. It's very, very good. Um, produces extremely well. It does ripen, it seems like a bit late, but it produces a huge Braba crop. Like uh, I think somebody in the Pacific Northwest would highly benefit from this variety. Um, maybe that was a fluke, but I've seen multiple years now, it produces a ton of Braba. And they will ripen. Um, and the fruit is a really highly flavored fig, uh, especially even in California when caprified. I've seen some photos of a grower that is growing this variety there. I think this one is, it's got a lot of potential in terms of, uh, in terms of flavor. Rondé Bordeaux, standard. You can't go wrong with it. Super early. Does tend to split. Negra de Agde, this one really impressed me this year. Again, same thing with all the rain, the hurricane. Uh, we did a couple videos on this, uh, even have a video coming out soon on it. Um, very highly flavored fruit, acidic, cherry flavored. Uh, you can tell this is a very, very good fig. I was blown away. Uh, Martinenca Blanca, this is just the white version. Actually, excuse me, it's not even a white version of Martinenca. Uh, this is vastly different than Martinenka Ramada or just bl plain old Martinenka. This is a totally different variety. If you look at Ponza's book, you read about it, it actually is showing really good characteristics. Um, it doesn't ripen too late. It doesn't really split. It handles in the rain well. And of course, it's going to taste very good. 
Um, in fact, this fruit impressed me so much this year that I planted the variety in the ground. Um, I really like the production on it. I really like the shape of the fruits on it. Um, it did ripen a little bit later than I would have liked this year, but that's just is what it is. Um, and you know what? Uh, I think that one will be in my collection going forward uh, in, a, in a positive way. Who knows uh, what that fig will bring. Kesariani, this is just another standard, hardy Chicago type. Can't go wrong with it. Smith, it's easily one of my best figs. We only have, I think, one or two sets of that left. Um, so there's a lot of options here, guys. Um, I just wanted to go through over that. Now, I guess we'll we'll start with the the video here. But again, if you're interested in the cuttings, message me prom the promotional code Ross before you buy the cuttings. I'm sorry. You have to purchase the cuttings. You can hit the buy it now, but before you actually pay for them, um, message me the promotional code. I will uh, adjust the invoice so that you can pay the invoice with the discount attached. It will not automatically do that for you. You have to message me. Um, okay. So what did we learn this year? Well, I have a number of things here that we've. I want to kind of cover. Um, again, this one's going to be a long one, but what I did do actually today just now was I created this blog post about the end of season thoughts, very similar to what we're doing right now, but we did this for 2019 and I made this extremely long post back in the day, back in the day, it was only a couple years ago on our figs and I didn't want to lose it there. So I just copied what I had written and put it here on the blog. Um, this was a really, really great blog post that I wrote up back then. We talk about my favorite varieties, thoughts on synonyms. And then in the beginning here, we talk about techniques and just overall in general things that we've learned this, that year. Uh, we talked about, we had ripening order of these fruits. Um, we talked about, you know, this is when I had a lot more time <laughs> and we talked about some of my favorite varieties, uh, different characteristics to these varieties. We talked about a coal list, which varieties I was getting rid of that year. This was extremely detailed. Um, then we went ahead and actually did a similar thing in 2020 in an episode of fruit talk. 2020 end of season fig uh, fruit talk and end of season fig. That doesn't make any sense. End of fig season. But uh, in this particular video, we talked a lot about varieties. We did talk a little bit in the beginning here about things that we learned. Particularly, we talked about the shape of fruits. Uh, we talked a lot about light at that point. Uh, we talked about pinching, uh, things like splitting. Um, you know, and then at the end of the video, most of the video, we talked about different varieties that I really had, had liked for those particular reasons. Um, so there's these, ver this video here, there's also this blog post here that we just created. Um, and of course you could just type in Ross Ratty end of season here in, uh, YouTube and something like that will come up. We also in 2021, just recently, uh, talked about our favorite varieties. So if you're interested in some of the varieties that we really like, and for the reasons that we, we liked them and, um, some of the, you know, reasons and things for that, we did a video on this. Then we even just went a step further and narrowed it down after some special and careful consideration here, um, about my top 20 fig varieties for humid climates. And this really broke it down um, for the particular varieties and the reasons for that. This video though is not gonna be about varieties, uh, even though in the beginning we did touch on varieties there with the, the ones that we're selling. But this is more about, um, you know, the things that we've learned over the years. And I have a couple posts here. So this is one in 2019. Here's one that we did actually in 2019 as well. So we had some thoughts on growing figs in 2019. Our thoughts had drastically changed in 2020, I think. 
And then with that knowledge, we've really come to this point and observed new things this year. And we've really, I think, stepped up our our knowledge base, uh, especially in this year, guys. Um, so I kind of want to bring you along before we get to the stuff about 2020. I want to bring you along about what we did in the past, because this is extremely critical to see where we've come from, how we got to this point, the whole journey. I know you guys love this kind of stuff. Some of you guys love it. Some of you guys don't, but, um, I think it's important to consider this kind of stuff. So let's see here in, you know, this post here on the blog, figboss.com six years ago, it talks about pruning and it should be light. And actually this really hasn't changed. My views on this have not changed at all. In fact, we did our pruning video very recently or our non pruning video this year, because we did no pruning. Um, our pruning was extremely light. If I really did almost no pruning on the container figs this year, because really the, you can narrow it down to, I'd rather stake the branches than prune them. You know, I'd rather keep the wood there, um, keep that energy within the tree, maximize more of that light by bending the branches, staking the branches and opening up the canopy rather than relying on pruning to kind of shape my tree. You don't have to be pruning to shape your tree. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting how the hormones work within figs and that, or really most fruit trees and most plants, you know, you, you prune during the winter, your tree next year, the hormonal response is to grow. If you prune during the summer, the hormonal response of your plants is to actually flower and fruit. So, you know, you can be pruning in the winter, no doubt, even just removing the tips, just removing three inches of wood um, on all the branches. And you'd see a lot of growth the following season because of that. I just don't think it's really that necessary. Um, and here, actually, I mentioned what Pons had said, mostly in his book. And I just really do believe this more than ever um, in that we really should be limiting our growth. Now, there are special circumstances. There are people who live in very long season climates and they don't want to have these large trees and they'd rather just do something easy. So you can hack your tree down to a very low height. And it'll re-sprout from that and fruit in a longer season climate. It's just that when you do something like that, it can be a little bit more difficult to really get it to fruit the following season. You have to be really um, have a higher light environment. You have to really know kind of what you're doing. Um, I just don't really recommend that to the average grower. It's just not something I think is a good idea. It's just not. Um, for many of us, doing something like that would completely eliminate all the fruit that we were supposed to achieve in that season. So uh, as a general recommendation, very minimal pruning, if any, um, not to say that you can't prune very heavily and see good results. It's just that you really need to know what you're doing. And again, light is absolutely critical. As we learned last year in 2020, you know, light is what really sets the fruit buds on the branches. So as the branches are growing, if we don't have the light necessary, that that particular variety requires the intensity, the duration of light, whatever that exact mathematical formula is, which cannot really be easily observed. Um, whatever that is, if you don't achieve that level of sunlight, you don't get the fruit buds. That's why varieties like Smith, Colonel Lippmann's black cross really struggle. Excuse the background noise guys, if there is any, um, but that's why those two varieties really struggle to actually set their fruits because they are more well adapted. I'm sorry. They're less adapted to lower light conditions. They require a high amount of light to actually set the fruit buds as the branches grow. Absolutely critical to understand that point. So pruning, you know, really when you think about pruning, you should be considering the light considering the maximization of the light. And when you prune back to a particular point, if my finger is the branch that we've now pruned it to, and now we have just the stump that's left, well, all along this branch, we then will see new, new branches come out. And the unfortunate reality is, is that along this point, we then have 
a conglomerate of leaves that try to form as the branches start to spread away from each other and form that natural growth habit of that particular variety. Some varieties do it better than others. You know, some are more erect and some are more outspreading and reach for that light and a better habit. So, you know, you just end up having a situation where if you were to cut it like this and have it re-sprout like that, it's just more difficult, I find, for the average grower to achieve the light that they need um, to actually set those fruits and have a productive tree. In some situations, you prune off all that growth, well, you're going to lose the brava. In other situations, you prune off that growth, and I think, well, you're going to lose out on some earliness of your fruits as well. So by preserving the growth tips, by preser preserving a lot of that wood, we actually have an earlier harvest. Um, some people may argue that by doing a harder prune, pruning more, you actually end up increasing your production over the length of the season, which could be possible, but um, uh, you have to couple that with fertilizer and lots of water. Water is the absolute critical thing there in that, in that um, theory or in that, uh, that claim that often is forgotten. Um, and when we increase the water to a higher extent, we lose out on fruit quality. So you're going to get more fruits potentially, at least in theory, but you're going to lose out on quality. So, you know, there's a trade-off and that needs to be explored. I think more in my own opinion here to really, to, or my own, uh, observations and experiences to really, um, understand, you know, what are the differences, but in a sense, we really should just be minimum setting up the form that we need to reach the most amount of sunlight possible, keep that form, and we can maybe go back to that. Maybe if we want to prune a very hard prune, we can always go back to that. Um, and that's not the worst thing in the world, although I think in most situations, not ideal. But again, that's still a valid thing. But I think it gets way worse when you do much more uh, hard pruning when you're actually disrupting the permanent structure of the tree. Um, and therefore your tree is actually maximizing less light, you know? So that's, uh, that one's important to me at least. Um, so what else we got here? Um, heating in the soil is extremely important. Yeah. That's been something we've known for years. I totally agree with that. We need to focus about focus really on planting higher, for most of us, planting our trees above grade, one to two foot high mounds, maximizing the heat in the spring. Um, and it just seems to me at this point to be a no brainer uh, for, you know, uh, really getting our trees to that right metabolic rate, 78 degrees Fahrenheit in the soil so that our trees can perform metabolically at an optimal level. And when you have that more optimal metabolic rate, for a earlier point of the season, you have an exponential increase in production and performance. So in terms of uh, consistent soil moisture being key for quality, we have also really, I think, hammered that in. I think I truly believe, uh, especially that we highlighted this actually this season where we have a planting actually in the front of the house over here where the soil is extremely dry and it stays dry for most of the year, um, in fact, it's so dry that the trees really don't grow that much because the water is the on or off switch of the growth. So if you have less water in the soil, the trees don't really grow that much. And um, it's really well demonstrated over there in that that planting I have in the front where we're doing our hardiness experiment there with uh, about nine or 10 varieties. I also noticed there, because the soil is so much drier, the figs just taste straight up better. So the quality increases substantially um, when you have a lower and consistent soil moisture. Um, and uh, you know what? It's also really critical for dropping, right? So um, I think splitting, it may, it may impact splitting as well to some degree, having a more consistent soil moisture as we've talked about in prior years. But I think more of that is based on the shape uh, based on the rain and actually the rain hitting the fruits um, and expanding the fruits 
Um, I think, yeah, actually, no, 100% the uh, soil moisture. If you have an inconsistent soil moisture, that's going to definitely affect splitting as well to some degree. Um, it's not just a one-size-fits-all answer, though. There are multiple things, I think, happening in regards to splitting. Uh, but that's critical, you know, and still, to this day, I think we, we agree with that. Um, number four here that we talked about in 2019, in-ground trees can produce almost as early as potted trees. This also I proved this year. Um, I think I even proved it last Well, I had the, you know, at least some of the data last year that it, it was definitely possible. But this year I had in-ground trees, an in-ground tree, little ruby, that produced earlier than any of the potted trees. So... Um, Maybe this statement is even slightly wrong in that the in-ground trees produce earlier than the potted trees. I don't know. Um, what is for certain, though, is that they will produce as early as the potted trees. I have no doubt. Um, and the whole original theory was that because the trees are in containers, they're above grade, their soil is warmer in the spring, as I said, the metabolic rate, right? And when we talked about number two... That was critical. Uh, it is critical and actually will produce earlier fruits. So if you can replicate that same exact thing in the ground by planting your fig tree higher above grade, mimicking a container, then there's absolutely no reason why it won't produce um, as early as the potted trees. Um, so that's, you know, extremely critical for me. This one here, the sap flow control is important. I don't really believe in this. And I said here... More testing is needed, but I will be bleeding most of my high vigor in-ground varieties come next spring because the idea was we let the sap bleed on some of the branches and that will slow down the vigor of the trees. This is just, uh, maybe there is some truth to this, but it's absolutely unnecessary for the most part because really what controls the vigor or the growth of the tree is the water in the soil. And I can't really have less water in my soil it is what it is so by bleeding it's not really going to do much in fact it, it's not going to i don't think the tree is really going to like that so um i think i'm more so totally against this idea now um and i'm really more just concerned with the with the water uh rootstock is key for specific varieties um productivity can dramatically change if grafted i had Definitely suspected this for a long time, but after blah, 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 uh, this week. Blah, blah, blah. So I do believe that every variety, if you are testing them for purposes of comparing them to one variety to the next, the most ideal scenario is to graft them on the same rootstock. The problem is you need a very healthy rootstock and you need a healthy base to every tree. Now, the productivity 100% can change depending on the variety that you have grafted it onto. Because you may have just a uh, a faster growing root system, a you know a standard fig variety versus let's say a dwarf fig variety, right? The dwarf fig variety is just not going to produce more fruit over a longer period of time than the standard. However, if you plant many of those dwarfs in a very high dense system, then I don't see why not you can't uh, compete actually. Um, as we've really looked at our high dense systems this year, which we'll get into at some point in this video. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think in terms of grafting, you can make the easy mistake of grafting it onto a variety or a rootstock that's not very healthy. And that will set your tree up for failure forever. And you can't rejuvenation prune your rootstock once you've grafted it, because when you rejuvenation prune, you're cutting the whole thing back and then you would cut off the whole graft union and that's just not a good idea. So the root sock and the scion have to be extremely healthy um, for me to really recommend grafting these varieties. Fig mosaic virus kind of destroys that whole idea and ruins it for certain people. But if uh, you had a variety like, let's say, Col de Blanc or Black Madeira or Hatib de Argentile or Aishia Black from UC Davis, those are just 
not the healthiest varieties if they're from UC Davis, right? Um, or from particular sources. Now, but if you had rejuvenation pruned those trees, as I really got to see this year with my Ashia Black and so many other trees now that we've done over the years, but my Ashia Black, which is the notorious variety for being heavily subjected to fig mosaic virus, um, I have seen that variety completely shake off the virus for the most part this year um, and become so much healthier. Now, if I took Scion from that very healthy specimen, grafted it onto a very healthy rootstock, then I think that's a great idea. But if either one of them, the Scion or the rootstock, is not healthy, I don't think it's a great idea. Do I think it's key for specific varieties grafting them? Not necessarily at least none that I can really think of right now. Reason being is that if you rejuvenation prune those particular varieties, they will become very healthy and you'll have a established very healthy tree. Now you can speed up the process of having a very healthy tree or let's say Hatib de Argentil, which historically really doesn't produce a strong root system very quickly. Uh, as some people have noted in the past, I don't think that's really true because if you have a, a healthier strain or a healthier source of that particular variety, you don't have anything to worry about. Um, you could just plant that thing in the ground or even keep it in a container and it'll produce a root system fine. But there are some varieties which I'm sure because they are dwarf, because their root systems are more difficult to establish than others, you know, the, again, the argument between a dwarf versus a standard. I think it's a better idea to graft them for production purposes if you wanted that onto a standard. And that's, I think, as far as my recommendation will go in that sense, or if you are going to compare varieties side by side, it does indeed depend on how you're growing them. If you're growing them for commercial ability and, and how dense the plantings are and and what your purpose is, then particular rootstocks will be key and critical. But the production of our fig trees are largely based on light. So if you have a faster growing rootstock that's able to reach more light very quickly, well, then you can, I, I guess, benefit from a higher production. And that's kind of it. But really, your variety should, I think, be more adapted to lower light environments and that will actually be a higher consideration in terms of production than what rootstock it's on. You know, Celeste, as an example, certain strains of Celeste are extremely, extremely productive and don't require a lot of light to set those fruits. And you can have a lot of fruiting branches in a very small space and you end up getting a huge production off of the, that particular variety. Uh, and then here, you know, we talk about rejuvenation pruning here, which absolutely is 100% true and something I really, really uh, value as a technique in my arsenal. And anyone who grows figs and deals with the fig mosaic virus, as everyone does, it's extremely critical. Um, this here, we talk about synonyms. Um, let's see, we talked about this in September of 2020. So this is when I think we really got a handle on synonyms and things like that. And, um, you know, this is in the words of Pons, Montserrat Pons, which is really the leading expert in the world on figs. I don't think really anyone comes close. But we do also have some interesting thoughts on Celeste and how this relates to synonyms and things like that. And how I think genetically we can kind of clear this up. I think we can make some pretty good observations Based on the limited genetic testing that we have, um, you know, there is somebody named Richard in one of the fig communities that is um, growing a lot of these fig varieties to test them genetically. And he thinks he's going to crack the case and, and uh, you know, really break, <laughs> break the whole thing wide open and, uh, you know, really see which variety is the same as some other variety. Um, I think what he's going to find without really wasting any of his time, um, he's going to find that a lot of varieties share the same genetics. Now, 
as we've talked about in the past, there is a huge list of Hardy Chicago types. We go to the Fig Synonym spreadsheet here that I have also down in the description. Look at all these Hardy Chicago types that I've listed. And there's more. I have, uh, over the years, stopped adding to this list. Uh, it's the same thing with a lot of these. Maybe not all of them, definitely not all of them are synonyms. But look how many different Violet de Bordeaux there is. Um, you know, it's kind of crazy uh, how many of these there are of different figs. Celeste is no different. And John Verdict did some in this particular Celeste um, post that I made here on the blog. He says that generally, excuse me, I propagate from Celeste JN, GM, IS, and Blue Celeste JN. Those are my favorites, which, which is why I propagate them. Fruit Drop has not been an issue with any Celeste in my collection. The USDA slash UC Davis DNA testing indicates that all the Celestes and Blue Celestes are the same. We tested 19 different ones, but performance here is not the same. It's extremely critical. He um, also here with Pons, Pons mentions that uh, La Hivernenka, Koldenam Katat, De La Senora, Margalera, Mora de Bu, are genetically equal varieties by dendogram, but different molecularly and agronomically, maturation, size, shape, etc. So they are considered different varieties. De La Senora variety is called by different names as we have seen in synonyms, this, be, this being provoked by the great variability which affects the morphological characteristics of the figs and to a lesser degree, the foliage. Um, so really, really interesting how Pons is saying as well, these varieties are the exact same varieties genetically, if you looked at their genetics. Now, I also, you know, I don't really fully understand it, but uh, let's say I had a twin, right? An identical twin, and our genetics should be the same. There's two Rosses, but if one Ross lived somewhere else and I lived here, or let's say even we had different habits, then we're going to have slightly different genetics. Uh, isn't that called epigenetics or something like that? I think that's the term where some of our genes can turn on and off and we can express different characteristics just based on that. So at least for me, I think that's blatantly obvious of what's happening here with the synonyms, um, whether that's Celeste, whether that's other figs, that if you looked at them under a microscope, saw their genetic code, they would be the same. However, you observe them, you have a keen eye, you know what you're doing. You're gonna know they're not the same variety. Um, are they very similar? Yes, which we've always thought. Um, so yeah, there will be one strain of Celeste as I think you know, Black Celeste is as an example in this case, is the superior strain of Celeste that I've come across. The same thing with uh, with Azores Dark in terms of uh, Hardy Chicago's. Now there is also the the also the argument that can be made that I don't even think really Black Celeste would share the same genetics as Celeste. I think it's probably va um, there's something going on there that is different than the other strains of Celeste that I've seen. But even again, even if they did share the same genetics, that's what I'm getting to is that they're performing and you can observe them very differently, whether that's for maturation, size, shape, etc. They're considered different varieties, um, even though they may share a similar name. So that's a very interesting thought. Now, um, let's see here. We, uh, in, here's another blog post here from 2019 about our thoughts and things like that. We talked about reducing splitting. I think, uh, again, same thing, consistent watering in the soil. Less water will definitely contribute to less splitting, as we talked about with the trash bags on top of the soil. You want to have drier periods in the soil, um, but you want to have things consistent, consistently moist. Um, but the shape is really critical for splitting, as we've talked about the length of the stem this year and last year, the length of the neck, uh, the slender body, the overall shape, whether that's pyriform, ovoidal, 
you know, um, your Ciolato typically tends to split more often. Uh, a spherical or round figs tend to split more often. Uh, but it's not just about the shape. It's also about the length of the neck. And it's also about the, um, you know, length of the stem. Because the way that the fig hangs is also very critical. The Even the uh, stiffness of the neck, as we've talked about also here on the blog. Um, let me see here. So in this post that we talked about, we did talk about the different characteristics that we're judging a lot of these varieties on. And again, I think it's it's not just about how it, you know, how it's shaped, but also how it hangs. Because if the eye is pointed towards the sky as it's ripening, and the fruit, the water, excuse me, from rain or even dew is on the fig in a depression or on the top of the fruit, uh, where the eye is, excuse me, if the eye is pointing upwards as it's ripening, that's a very sensitive area. And you're just going to have problems because the skin is going to absorb that that moisture into the skin, into that fruit as it ripens, as it's swelling, as it's getting larger and changing color. When that fast expansion occurs because of that water absorption, you then end up having uh, the fruit split, especially at the location at the eye where it is very, very sensitive. So you want a fruit that hangs downwards and have the eye is pointed downwards and there isn't any dew or moisture collecting at the eye or in a very sensitive spot or in a depression of the fruit. Um, so the shape and all of that is extremely important. Now the skin is also something that we learned a lot about this year. This is something rather new where the skin uh, either contributes to that water absorption or it actually doesn't absorb water very easily. And I would certainly say that Celeste or spe specifically Black Celeste, I've noticed, does not absorb that moisture very easily or if at all. You may have a pretty good rainstorm and it seems like the fruit is wearing a waterproof jacket where the water just slides right down the jacket and doesn't actually absorb the moisture into the jacket, making you cold. So um, it's just incredible, I think, um, how the skin really relates to all these different things. Um, and it's not just a one size fits all answer in terms of the, you know, the, the shape and all of that. Um, the skin, I think, also is a pretty critical piece of information. So those are the, really, that's the main thing here in terms of, I think the new one that we've looked at, we, we did look at the lower light environments. So how the productivity relates to, um, the amount of light that it needs to set the fruit buds. Uh, we talked about, you know, hang time as we always do the shape, the stem length, the rain resistance, the shedding of the water. We've talked about drying capabilities, plenty in the past. Um, yeah, so those are, those are the main things that we've deal with here in terms of obtaining the most optimum fruit quality in a human place. Um, in terms of SWD or the spotted wing drosophilia or fruit flies, it can be very difficult dealing with them. I still think traps are a great idea. I'm going to probably in the future, if I really start to see this black cherry tree in my backyard, which really encourages their populations, as I've talked about here on the blog, I'm going to put out some traps. You know, I don't think it's enough to just do that bucket. I think traps, really trapping them in the trap, luring them and trapping them in, I think is critical. Picking up all the fallen fruit, you know, uh, you don't want to have your fruits ripen for extended periods of time on the tree at that point. Rain can really... Um, proliferate their numbers, more, you know, more humid conditions, even decaying leaves, decaying things, fermenting, fer fermentation particularly. So that's, that's a tough one. The same thing here, oh, actually, this is what we mentioned years ago about cracking and splitting down the side of the fruit. Here's an interesting little thing about this. We've said years ago that excess nitrogen and temperature swings are the bigger culprits in terms of cracking and splitting on the side. 100% agree with that. 
that's still to this day very true. Now, there is some splitting down the side that usually is quite large that I see on particular varieties. That is, I believe, because of the skin. There's a different pliability to the skin that you will even note in splitting and things like that. Some varieties just have a skin that's like um, breaks at the easiest moment, you know, at the, the at that really expansion of the fruit, it just tends to break easier. Whereas other varieties maybe can expand a bit more and the fruit can, the skin can give a little bit and not necessarily really tear. Or if it does tear, it's really not all that much. Um, you know, for me at least, there's a certain consistency or quality to the skin that really needs to be observed, not just in terms of water absorption, but also in splitting. Either it's at the eye or even down the side or in, or in terms of cracking, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, we talked about also short hang time and pruning concerns, rejuvenation concerns, different ways of growing figs in containers, which I also sort of covered in this video. Um, so yeah, that's, that is it there for that. All right. So what else do we have left? We have to talk about the low tunnels. All right. So let's talk about this really quickly. Varieties that drop their fruits. Um, there is a uh, prior thoughts that, and a lot of people struggle with this is actually not having enough soil moisture. So if you just don't have enough consistent soil moisture, you will drop your fruits. There are, of course, other reasons for dropping fruits. Um, you know, whether or not your tree requires pollination, right? Maybe it could be a San Pedro or a Smyrna or even a male fig. Um, typically, though, those are the two biggest reasons. But I think the third biggest reason, and a reason that is extremely important for specific varieties like Celeste, Pastelier, those two really come to my mind in particular. Also, St. Martin, I'm growing as well. And even maybe, I know St. Martin's there. I don't want to, I don't want to throw any other ones in there just yet, but those three varieties, whether it's, you know, any of the Celeste I'm growing, maybe not Black Celeste that I've noticed just yet, but certainly with Stallion and Viola de Marseille and um, a whole host of these different Celeste figs that I'm growing that are relatively established. And, and even Pastelier, oh, that's not good. Even, even Pastelier, which should have, you know, a lot of soil moisture. I mean, these trees are really well established in the ground. I, I, you know, I have plenty of soil moisture. Why are these varieties, and, and it's just not just for me. This is across the board for tons of people in the fig communities over the years. I mean, these varieties are just notorious. Celeste is common. Pastelier, we believe, at least some people believe it, it's partially parthenocarpic in that some figs on the tree require pollination and some figs don't. But for the most part, we know that they're common. We know that they ripen outside of areas with out the wasp um, without the blastophaga. So why is this happening for some people and it's not happening for others? Well, again, it could be the moisture in the soil. But for me, my new opinion and my new theory on this, and I really need to have another year before I can guarantee that this is, I think, true. But certain varieties, guys, just need more light as the fruits are ripening to stay on the tree. If you don't have enough light the the fruits as they're ripening maybe not even as they're swelling i'm talking about maybe you know 30 to 60 to, to something around there 75 days into the whole process of them ripening if the tree is just keep growing and growing and growing and maybe you you set your fruits really down low on the canopy and now there's all this sunlight at the top of the tree but it's all completely shaded down below the tree is going to reject those fruits. Um, that's just my my new theory on this whole thing is that you need the light even as the fruits are ripening. Otherwise, the tree, again, is just going to reject them. Depends on the variety highly. Depends on the variety, you know, but I think across the board, it's just a great rule of thumb. You want, you want more light anyway. 
reaching the fruits as they ripen. You don't want the fruits to be completely shaded as they're ripening, right? Um, okay, so that's something for the future to really observe more so on my trees, the ones I, I mentioned. Uh, let's see here. So we talked about, um, you know, this year we, we, we observed a similar phenomenon to if we had wrapped our trees and I really haven't done much wrapping in the past. I've had varieties that have gone through the wintertime, survived and had no damage and no winter dieback. That happened this past season with my little Ruby, with my Texas BA1, very mild winter this past year. And it was amazing to observe those trees, how they grew, how they fruited, how early they were, how productive they were, how much energy they had. Even the Braba crop was not a hindrance to the main crop, as we had typically believed in the past with our container trees, that the Braba crop does indeed slow down the production of the main crop. I think that's just not as much of a, of a case if you are not pruning and your trees are getting through the wintertime with no damage. Um, there's just a lot more energy, I think, within the tree. If you do a heavier pruning, you got some Brabas. That Braba crop, I think, does indeed hinder the production of the main crop. Um, okay, so that was interesting, again, I think, to really observe that. I guess to kind of wrap up my thoughts is that I'd rather not prune my trees, even in my high dense system. You know, the whole idea of my high dense system of planting the trees two, two to three foot on center, and then is to throw a low tunnel over top. The low tunnels then give them all the heat. We talked about that metabolic rate at the beginning of this video, that 78 degrees Fahrenheit soil temperature is so critical and exponentially gives them more production and an earlier production. So it's absolutely critical, I think, that you know about that when you are doing such a hard prune, and that's why I'm doing it. But there's a, you're losing something. When I prune the trees to 6 to 12 inches like that, um, I'm losing some earliness because when I've noticed my trees just wrapping them just by getting them through the wintertime, as an example, with no damage, no pruning, it's, it was amazing to observe them, uh, see the differences right then and there. Um, I think you lose about two weeks of earliness by pruning them and pruning the tips particularly. Even just pruning off the tip, you lose, I think, two weeks, at least a week. Um, so for me, when you are going to be doing these low tunnel things, the, the low tunnels have to make up for the weeks lost and then some for it to be really worth it. Otherwise, I could just wrap all the trees or as I'm doing this year, limb bending. As we're bending all of the limbs or some of the limbs, the trunks all the way down to the, the ground, staking them to the ground and then covering them with, uh, with tarps to get them through the winter uh, with no damage. Um, and then they'll plop right back up, be right there, and it'll be like as if I wrapped them. It'll be as if I never pruned them, I never touched them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that seems to me to be a really safe, surefire bet. And of course, there's such high benefits to it. Um, so absolutely critical. Um, and that, of course, I think relates, brings us really into the density and the low tunnel situation here, where... The low tunnels, again, this year we've talked about it in our YouTube channel um, in a prior video we did not too long ago with our 2021, 2022 in-ground fig tree plan video that we did, where that one really was discussing the plans for the low tunnels in that I still believe that that is possible. However, we ran into some issues this year. Um, I got sick. I wasn't really able to observe my trees very well. And we blasted our trees with too much heat too soon in the spring. We need to let them wake up very slowly. And then we can kind of go a bit higher with the heat and get them going. Um, if you are not going to uh, ease into that heat, you're, what is inevitably going to happen, even if you did this in the greenhouse with potted trees. I've done this years ago and learned my lesson. It took me many years. But 
I'm still learning it today, right? Is that if you blast the trees with too much heat as they are dormant, they don't like that. And the branches will die back. You will have dieback on those branches um, while they are dormant. So you need the sap flow, I think. You need the tree to wake up for the trees to really um, be able to really benefit from that heat and not have that dieback. If you have the dieback, maybe the, the trees leaf out and then they die, and then the branches die back. I wasted an entire month this year. I lost an entire month, maybe even more on some of the varieties, um, depending on when they ripen next year. So really interesting um, with the low tunnels. I think that was really the biggest lesson. The density, I don't like the density either because of the, as we talked about in that video that we just mentioned as well, you can do it. You can plant them two to three feet on center. Um, it's a very high dense way of doing it. You can get a lot of fruits. I think it even competes with one large giant tree. Um, the amount of fruits you can get is pretty darn substantial. However, planting them that close uh, brings some challenges and I do not recommend that for the average person. And what I think is even is a better way of going about this and approaching this with the low tunnels, with a higher dense system, is to grow low Japanese cordons, Japanese espaliers, low step over uh, cordons. Those are easier to maintain. They maximize the light a lot better because when you have so many branches in a given area, there's only so much light that they can reach. And as we know, you need the light to set the fruits. So if you don't have a high light environment, but you're planting your trees so close, it's kind of a disaster at that point. It's just not going to work. Um, so you need the higher light environment. You need to know the really have a great eye and be able to really uh, manicure your figs in a very efficient and correct way for that to really work. Um, but again, it is possible in higher light environments and maybe it's not so much of an issue for the average person that uh, has full sun on their fig trees all day, as an example. Um, so that's, those are my thoughts on that. We also talked about pruning. We talked about the skin. We talked about rootstock, changing fruits after planting. Oh, so this was interesting, as we mentioned with the Daloso at the very beginning of this video, when we were looking at our listings and that our Daloso had changed pretty significantly when we planted it in the ground and that the fruits had a very long stem, a very long neck, and a more slender body. And because they the tree had reached more energy, it was able to uh, really photosynthesize a lot of that excess of energy into the fruits. I believe the fruits now are la uh, longer, excuse me, and larger on average because they're planted in the ground. Um, it's just, I think, something very, very well worth noting here. Um, in regards to what we've learned this year. And, and that, I think, kind of wraps this whole thing up here, guys. Um, we haven't learned too much more in terms of the flavor categories, I would say. I mean, this has been mostly the same. There are some fruits that probably I, are varieties I could add to different categories that I have not. Um, we haven't really gained, I think, any more, you know, insight on that. Um, let's see here. What else did we, this would be an interesting one right here. Yeah, this will probably be the only if I can think of anything else that we've learned this year. So there's varieties with a thick and dense texture, right? So there is something new that we did this year on our YouTube channel in a video where we're explaining how we are talking about bricks, you know, and the bricks of these particular varieties. Um, I have to still do some research on this, but it seems like to me that 
something is especially occurring, even if you were to pick the fruit a little bit early, maybe not at the most optimal time that you would for fresh eating or that I would do, because I like to let them ripen for a long time and even sort of dry up on the tree. But if you pick them a little bit earlier, maybe at the level that most people would probably pick them at, and you cut them in half, and then you put them on a plate. Let's imagine this is a plate. You put them with the skin side down on the plate. You don't stack them on top of each other. You spread them out. You put this plate or this tray then in the fridge. They will continue to dry up and turn into the, like this candy very, very slowly in the fridge. Kind of like a, a dried persimmon, a dried haichia, hoshigaki type thing where if you threw the persimmon in the dehydrator at a higher temperature, you dried it very quickly, you would kind of ruin it. You'd lose out on something. But if you did it very, very slowly like a persimmon, it turns into the most amazing thing. The same thing happens in the fridge with these particular varieties. And as they ripen, I think, uh, as I have more heat, as the figs have a shorter hang time with the increased soil temperatures, I think they just get a thicker and denser texture, more jammier pulp as I saw this year with Smith. As some of the Smiths this year were as dense and cakey as a col de dame. It was just kind of mind blowing. Um, and then of course, changing the texture and the overall eating experience of the fruit by putting it in the fridge, that was really quite something. Uh, let's see here, light requirements. This is an interesting one right here. This one for sure. I don't think actually the Dalosa belongs in this anymore. Um, but the rest of these I think do. Now, Celeste is an interesting one as well because some of the strains of Celeste seem to require a bit more light than others. It's really quite strange. Um, but even getting them to set their fruits, you still need to have the light as the fruits are progressing in their, their process. Uh, low light requirements. These are varieties that probably will fruit at a higher production. This is definitely not a great list, I don't think. Uh, let's see here. Short hang time, pest targets, Brava producers, consistent soil moisture. That was an interesting point that we did learn about Brava's in that having a tree that has a ton of energy whether it is in a container, it's really well established in a container, or if it is really well established in the ground, maybe three to five years in the ground, you don't have to really worry about the Brava, it seems like, slowing down the main crop nearly as much as I had originally worried. And it may not even slow it down at all for the most part. Um, maybe it's so minimal that it's not even noticeable um, when a tree is, again, well established uh so we have um yeah let's see here yeah well that's that's kind of it here guys um those are i think the main things that we've learned this year um i wish there was i hope there isn't anything i'm forgetting at this point but that's a lot of information for you guys and i know that you guys will definitely benefit from all of that um it'd be nice i think one day to go through you know, something like uh, Condit's monograph. I don't recall exactly if he has, you know, a good um, introduction. Yeah, this is, I think, this doesn't even seem like the full thing because you have it starting at 323. Introduction, acknowledgments, varieties of the Capra fig, varieties, varieties, varieties varieties the, maybe in the introduction it will tell you how to grow figs you know um, hmm. yeah so it would be nice if, if I went through I think in the future even like Pons's book and read through you know some of the things that uh, he says in his book whether it's regarding pruning or water or light or you know heat or whatever it is and um for my own uh things on those you know my own opinions on those um kind of like what we did for the um california rare fruit growers 
which we did put out the video on that. Where is that video? California rare fruit growers. So this Zoom meeting that we did here on, you know, on YouTube, actually, you can find it where I really break down. Um, you know what? Here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the... Uh, I think I called it the Fig Commandments, didn't I? The Fig Commandments. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so this this particular post it would be I think it's super nice to be able to go through this have a listing now of all my thoughts on things like water on things like food and fertilizer and sunlight and temperature and pruning um planting and propagating and you know all these different things miscellaneous techniques and things like that um to then you know, put this all together in one spot, maybe in the future, of course, have something like this in, uh, in my book, as an example, on figs. So yeah, it's interesting um, where this journey has now taken me, what we've learned, how things have changed over the years. It's just, uh, I, if you guys enjoyed this, you got to this point, I'd highly recommend reading this particular post. This is uh, really well done. And uh, I think we'll really recap a lot of what we said. So, all right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Take care. We'll see you for the next video. Hit that subscribe button. Check out our blog. Check out the auctions here. And uh, we'll catch you guys for the next video. Take care.